done on your amazing performance. Now I would like to ask Dr. Paul and Alana, our special guests from the Bakai Foundation to address us. Dr. Paul and Alana who have come here to give a special prize and slight problem. We need the person to go and get that person who's going to get the special prize. But Dr. Paul will talk to us about writing. He's an author. He's also a skin specialist in cancer. So he looks at children and adults and diagnoses skin, dis skin diseases as well, skin diseases and cancers with them and works with them on cures. He's also just come back from overseas where he's been uh, talking at a conference on that and he might talk a little bit about uh, writing. He's a writer, he's published books. I'm not sure how many books you've published, uh, Doc. Four books. And uh, um, there was a competition at school of, um, in Auckland and one of our ch children here entered and did very well. But we'll leave that to Dr. Paul to explain. So over to you. Let's give him a big welcome, please. Good afternoon. It's a real privilege to come here and see a wonderful performance. Um, basically, I'll tell you a little bit about what I do. I won't speak for very long because it's the afternoon. Um, and I'll then tell you about the real reason why I'm here. So first of all, as the principal just said, I'm a medical doctor. Um, and the reason I'm saying the next thing is really just to inspire you that you can do whatever you want in life. So last year I was awarded the New Zealand Medical Association's highest award. It's only given to one doctor in the whole country and it's only given to one doctor across all fields of medicine. And last year I was in the firing line for that. Um, but what I want to tell you is uh, a little bit about my childhood. See, I was born in England and my parents went back to India, where I'm originally from, to do medical mission work. They both were doctors and we lived in parts of India where there were no proper schools or cities. So when I was your age, or a lot of the primary kids, the younger ones here, I actually went to school not by car or not on foot, but by bullock cart. Does anybody know what a bullock cart is? Anybody raise your hands up who knows what a bullock cart is? Do you know what a bull is? Cart pulled by a bull was a bullock cart, right? So anyway, the thing about this bull was um, to right through primary school, um, I went to school in a bullock cart and I used to ask the driver to teach me how to you know, ride this bull to school. Because it was great fun, you see, because if you're riding a bullock cart, every now and then the bull's tail would twitch and you'd hold the tail up for it to do poos on the road, you see, otherwise you'd get a messy uniform and they wouldn't let you into school. So anyway, so every day we went to school and India being a land of big contrasts, um, on the same road, in this remote place where there were hardly any roads, there was also an Audi, you know, the Audi motor car. But our bull may have been colorblind because the Audi was green, but our bull hated this Audi. So every time we would see this car, the bull would charge and cut it off. So I always got to school ahead of this Audi. And I was in this bullock cart, which was probably going a lot slower. So I used to, about two years ago, um, HarperCollins, which is an uh, um, international publisher, publishes some of my novels and nonfiction, asked me to write a story about my life. And I actually called it The Bull Who Dreamt He Was a Lamborghini because the car was much faster than an Audi. And the fact that, just like the bull, if you dream the impossible, then you can achieve what's possible. The second message I really have is the power of working hard. Um, there's your principals, your teachers say this to you every day and you probably don't listen to them, so I'm going to say it again. They did a study a few years ago and um, there's a gentleman called Malcolm Gladwell who wrote a book called The Outliers. And I met Malcolm at a conference just recently and one of the things they researched is the how does one achieve success so to be successful say in sport medicine writing whatever you like flying kites anything you can think of playing music um, doing the haka whatever it is they said are you born with talent so if you look at your favorite sports star you know be it Roger Federer or Dan Carter or Sonny Williams whatever did, were they born with that kind of talent or did they work hard to achieve it? So they actually looked at can you measure success and what they found is it takes 10,000 hours for you to be the world's best at something. 
and this was virtually for everybody. So that means if you did something 20 hours a week, which means four hours a day, it's roughly about 50 weeks in a year. You can have a couple of weeks off at Christmas, so that gives you 1,000 hours, and if you did it for 10 years, it becomes 10,000 hours. Now, the funny thing is they actually qualified, they looked across all sports people, scientists, various things, and on average, everybody became the best in the world at about 10,000 hours. Some of them, if you were really talented, maybe you got there at 9,500, but it didn't, still took a lot of hard work. I've learned a little bit about that myself over the years. So what happened is I also teach at the University of Queensland in Australia. I teach surgery there. So once every few weeks, I have to go across to Australia and teach. And the funny thing I thought about it is if I looked at the time I spend in my medical practice or my operating rooms or doing research, because I spend a day a week working with kids like you all, it generally would have been about 20 hours a week. So what I found is that I just kept doing my work 20 hours a week in New Zealand and not worrying about anything else. And sure enough, 10 years after I had started my practice, I had a call from the University of Queensland and they said, we want you to come and head the department because we think that you are the best at doing this anywhere in the world. And I said, I, New Zealand's home, so I'll stay here, but I'll come over once every few weeks. So when I met Malcolm, I could say that you see, if you need to be the best in the world, you, anyone here can be the best in the world at anything you want to be, but you'll need to put in 10,000 hours. All right, so which means you'll have to start working now if you want to get there fast. So that's all I really wanted to say. So the second thing is I'm going to tell you a little bit of about our foundation um, here on behalf of Bachi Foundation, which is a, my own charitable trust. Bachi means kisses in Italian. It originally started because B-A-C-I in Italian is pronounced Bachi. And that stands, it originally started because I had a bookstore in town which is called Bachi, which stood for Books, Art, Coffee, Inc. And we put our profits into programs in Lower Desal schools. And we fund libraries for schools, and we also run competitions for schools, and I teach creative writing in schools. So basically, uh, Alan, as a secretary of the trust, she's also my um, practice manager. And one of the things we do once a year is we have our annual prize giving, which is what we're here for. Now, before I um, tell you a bit more about the prize, so what happens this year is schools all over Auckland enter the competition. And we choose one story which we think was the best story. And each year there is a theme. And this year the theme was the invention I'd like the most. So we choose a story which we think is the best. And the person who wrote the story gets a little prize. And this year it's a video camera. It's a little, tiny little video camera, which I thought was quite nifty. I took it out and I thought, hey, I should be using this myself. And so we're going to, and if you just, so we've got a little video camera still out of the box, so it's got all the other charges and things that are in there. So that's going to be a little video camera for the person. And your school is going to win $5,000 worth of books, which are in the box there and there. And I'm going to give your principal a copy of my latest novel or for your school library as well. So, so what I'm going to do now, I'm going to call out the name of the winner. And the winner is going to come up and read their story and claim their prize. So the winner of the 2000, are you guys good at doing drum rolls? Okay. Have a, have a, have a not yet, not yet. So, that's good practice, okay. So, the winner of the 2013 Bachi Lounge, Bachi Foundation Trust short story competition with a story titled, Baby Mop is Sissy Patea. Now you can do the drum roll. Gabby, get off the floor. Gabby is a 12-month-old baby who is addicted to crawling on the floor. 
Gabby is the youngest child of a family of five. The oldest sister is 17-year-old Abigail. The second oldest brother is 15-year-old Daniel. The middle child is 12-year-old brother Dylan. The second youngest sister is 5-year-old Stacy May. And of course, baby Gabby. The floor is full of bacteria and dirt, but poor mum can't mop the floor because Gabby just won't get off the floor. Just what can I do? exclaimed mum, Angela. I have come up with an invention I'd like to call the baby mop. It is a recommendation to all babies who won't get off the floor. Angela had come up with a plan to design what the baby mop would look like. Angela decided she needs to go out to Alex's Emporium to buy a mop head for her invention. Arriving to Alex's Emporium, Angela was excited because she had come up with an idea to leave her baby crawling across the floor. Alex had a selection of mop material, so she took Gabby with her and let Gabby choose a colour that would go with her blue onesies. Gabby picked the light blue fluffy mop head. Angela was so excited that she almost fainted. They got home and Angela put baby Gabby on the floor while she was gathering all the pieces for her invention. Angela took a part, screwed on the parts and she did everything until her invention was just right. It was soft, blue and just perfect for Gabby. Gabby's baby mop was so light. Gabby was jumping up and down because she was so eager that she couldn't wait to try it on. Teenagers these days are so lazy and a pain up the beep. Phew, lucky I didn't say it in front of the little ones or else they will be asking me what it meant. So what should I name my invention, said Angela. Daniel said, how about get a life and let us get back to our own buzz. Thank you, Sissy, for reading a censored version of your story. <laughs> okay, um, that's all that concludes um, what I had to say, and we'll just, uh, somebody can wheel it to the library afterwards. I see the principal is here to say a few words. I'd like to just congratulate Sissy. As Dr. Paul said, we've talked about ambition and being successful, and everybody in this room can be that. We all can be successful, and once again, congratulations to Sissy on achieving such a high standard. She's only in year seven. So she's got another year at our school, so it's really well done. And thank you to the Kapahaka group. Once again, thank you for the books. I very much appreciate it. We appreciate books. Um, if the children realise the, the amount of money that goes into getting this bound of books, 5000 is a lot of hard work. So we do appreciate your generosity and of your foundation. And uh, we thank you once again. Let's give a big hand for that. Thank you very much. And uh, something for me to read in the weekend. <laughs>